This morning we will continue with verse 7 from Sri Sri Radharasa Sudhanidhi. So in the blue book, we're in the middle of page 24, just below the um, quote from Chaitanya Charitamrita. The word kala nidana, abode of arts, contains the syllables ka and la. The key to the important kama bij, transcendental seed of desire. The inv invocatory sound oof, of the Kama Gayatri and Gopal mantras. The limbs of Sri Krishna are present in each of the twenty-four and a half syllables of the Kama Gayatri Mantra, in which Mohan is the transcendental Cupid, and they fill the world with desire, just as the moon rays do. But by seeing Radha's moonlike face, even Mohan is pierced by Cupid's arrows. When Radha's moon-like face rises, the ocean of lusty desires of Mohan, the transcendental youthful Cupid of Vrindavan, swells up just as the ordinary ocean makes waves when the ordinary moon rises. After Shripad experienced all this in the abode of pastimes, <clears throat> being absorbed in his Sita Swarup transcendental identity the revelation disappears and in his Sadaka Vesh he prays when will we see Radha's moon-like face in this way. In other words, when will I be blessed with the service of my beloved Swamini?
with the words tan na may we all not only me be blessed like this shripad shows his great compassion Radha's moon-like face is the abode of beautiful moon rays and tender elegancy. Her sweet form is very effulgent, like a spotless full moon. <clears throat> showing all its 16 phases and giving joy to Cupid with its treasure of nectar. Her, her very sweet limbs are very enchanting and are fresh at every moment. When Madhava sees her wonderful, beautiful pastimes that are astonishing at every moment, he becomes enchanted. Sri Pabodananda sings, O moon of Maharaj Rishabhanu's dynasty. O queen of the bowers. I pray to you, alas, alas. When will we be so fortunate to see your face that is more beautiful than millions of moon rise. We can go back up a little bit if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do this part right after the Kamagaraitri. Mm. Right where you started there. And, um, and it's very nice to, in our meditations, to, to connect two things together. Well, the commentary does it for us, does the work for us, doesn't it? One is um, our constant prayer, we as sadhikas, we as devotees, our constant prayer for service. It's in every verse, every commentary. Please give me your service. Let me serve you. And actually, devotees in this crazy upside down, upside down world we live in, we go around thinking, how can I serve you and not how you can serve me, mm. which is the usual position. So we want service, and when we have service, then the desire of Krishna grows, the desire of Mohan grows, and the love of Parada grows. So first, we have this Kamagatri Mantra, which is a prayer for desire.
And we chanted every day in order exactly to increase the desire. Because we want the, we want Krishna's desire to grow. That's the first part. And then the second part is that, well, every time we can serve, then the ocean swells, then the desire swells. The ocean is always this sim, sim, symbol of the endless reservoir of prem, of love, divine love, which Krishna is. And when Radha is activated by our prayers, then the swells come, the waves come, the wa waves of desire. And they go up and down, just like our material desires do. They're not, they're not always the same. And in fact, it's exactly the waves of desire which characterize Radha's emotions. They're never just a laser, straight and flat. They're always coming and going, stronger and weaker, deeper and lighter, picking around the corners, playing hide and seek, playing games. What it says here, I don't, I didn't free find the words, but you read it, Mahatma, was that when we get the service, when we're allowed to serve, then the moon of her desire rises. So my point is, I'm a little long here. The point is that our service is directly connected with the desire of Krishna. We want him to feel more. We want Radha to love more. And that happens directly when we can give service. That's the goal of our service, to increase the love of Radha. Yeah. And it can also be this beautiful kind of circular pattern, right? Like as we're able to serve more, the love increases more, and, and then we're able to serve more, and then the love increases more, and it goes on and on in this way. And this is how it can be bottomless, is there is no no limit to the depth um, mm -hmm. because our service can be eternal. I like as you were sharing, I got this beautiful image of a moon rising and this is kind of our opportunity for relationship for service and you know before the moon before we actually see the moon we see this like faint light on the horizon and this is when our relationship is being established we can feel some we can see some we know it's there and we trust that it's going to continue to rise. And as this moon continues to rise, our relationship becomes deeper. It gets brighter. It strengthens as the moon rises. And then we see the first tiny little crest. And we're like, yay, the moon, my service has arrived. And we continue to see more and more of the moon and our service, this connection just builds and builds and builds until we see the full moon in this full experience. And this is, um, this is what we pray for, is even that faint light on the horizon. No matter where we are, we can always see more, more, more the moon can rise for us. And it has a daily cycle, this. The, obviously the moon does, mm. but also the lilas. Now there are eight different there are eight different lilas or sub lilas during the day, and they go up and they they go down. That's why it's mentioned sixteen here somewhere, isn't it? Yeah. These are the the eight different parts of of the lila, the different kinds of games they're playing, and they come and they go. So there's one for coming and one for going. Okay. So the desire rises and the desire falls. And when it disappears, like you say so nicely, Mahatma, uh, we can we still have this feeling that it's there, that this full desire is there. 
it's never completely gone. Even though the, the power of it, uh, the volume of it goes goes up and down. Like the moon. Like the moon. Even, even and if then the moon is it. always the, the symbol of Radha's face. Her yeah. beautiful face is moon-like. It's said very often. Yeah, I love the... Um, the thought of how Radharani's emotions are like waves and they're, they're constantly going up and down. And this is our, at least for me, this is, this is my experience with bhakti too. I have times where the waves are really high and I'm like, wow, I'm just like on top of everything and I'm feeling like connected and strong and like this is incredible and then the wave you know you drop off the backside and go into the trough and it's just like oh man the bottom of the bottom and you're like I'm so fallen nothing is ever going to happen for me and and these waves is what makes is what makes the like the troughs are what makes the peaks beautiful mm. if we if we only have the peaks, like you said, if there's only the laser, then we never really get this this deeper appreciation of what the peaks are. There's no variance in life. Um, you know, I think about like Gurudev says, without without salt, you can't taste the sweet. And if we don't have these these waves, if everything is just constant, then I think the true um, well, to use the word that we were discussing yesterday, or you guys were beautifully discussing yesterday, the, the true relishment of the peaks um, is only possible because of um, experiencing the troughs as well. Hmm. And this is, we can even push this, what you're saying, one step farther. Um, and say something about the difference between Gopi Bhav and Manjari Bhav. That everywhere in the Vedic literature you hear about Krishna as being the endless ocean of love. But then so what? There's the endless ocean of love. It's only through these waves pushing us and pulling us, giving a feedback from the ocean that we really experience that love. And that's what the Manjali Bhav is. It's a two-way relation to the reservoir of love. It's not just, oh, look, there's a lovely reservoir of love. It's something that we're in and pushing and swimming and splashing. <laughs> yeah. Connection to it, not just watching mm -hmm. it. Radhe Radhe, good morning, Dandavat. Sorry, okay. I'm in home. That's why I will come soon, but I cannot open video now. And uh, thank you for beautiful sharing, Uta Prabh and Mahatmaji. Especially uh, this sharing from Mahatma. So, moon come, then our timing to save our save timing will come. It's very touched my heart because I remember from this hearing, Radha put on her prophet Chandrika. Radha always put on this moon sign. This moon is represent like a saver timing. For example, moon come, then. In Brapax Manjari also, moon come, let's go Yamuna, or moon come, and let's go Rasarira, and Krishna Chandra come, this is the third time. It's like uh, this moon sign is represent Seva. And Radha is the uh, most highest uh, servant of Moham. For us, this moon is very important. In Bunzo, Radha put on her forfeit. I'm a servant sign, like a moon is servant, this seva. 
And we follow this like uh, moon like face means uh, moon like face means she's ready to serve more harm. And this moon up, then we are ready to serve our radical as Manjari. This come to my heart. Thank you for beautiful sharing, Sri Radha. When Radha's moon-like face rises, the ocean of lusty desires of Mohan, the transcendental youthful Cupid of Vrindavan, swells up just as the ordinary ocean makes waves when the ordinary moon rises. So as you're saying, Uddhav, without, the, without Radharani, there's no waves in the ocean. After Sripad experienced all this in the abode of pastimes, being absorbed in his Sita Swarup, transcendental identity, the revelation disappears, and in his Sadakavesh, he prays, When will we see Radha's moon-like face in this way? In other words, when will I be blessed with the service of my beloved Swamini? It's a, again, sorry to interrupt your lovely reading, but it's exactly what we had yesterday in the Lapakus Manjai. When she sees me, corresponds to when I do my service. So when I'm in my when I'm in my Siddha Deya, when I'm in my spiritual identity, simultaneously I'm serving directly and she's seeing me. Very much the same. With the words tan na, may we all, not only me, be blessed like this. Shripad shows his great compassion. This again refers to this beautiful thought that continues to surface for me that those that have this want to share it. They have this strong desire to give it to the world. We think about this like coming from Mahaprabhu. He's, he came down to, to share this, to share this incredible gift, this incredible mercy. And we see that channeled all the way through the Mahajans and the Acharyas down even to our Gurudev, who's constantly, you know, like almost shoving mercy at us. Even when we're like, oh, I'm not so sure that I really want this. He's like another Parata, wham, you know, like this is mercy and it's coming at you, whether you like it or not. And that is... 
to me, just such an incredible attribute. I mean, I feel like I don't really have words to describe how powerful and maybe how necessary that is because for me, like my material coverings are so strong that without this opposing force pushing this spiritual mercy pushing on us, uh, my coverings are too thick and they'll, they'll never get through. But this strong desire, this great compassion that they have to share this beautiful gift is really, um, to me, the desire to share the gift is equally as, maybe not equally, but it's also important, is, also, is another incredible attribute of the gift itself. And this, this uh, Tan Nan comment is quite beautiful too. The, um, it's about how when we're in Sarupavesh, when we're in our spiritual identity, then we're together with Radha. That Radha, Radha Mohan is not something far away and foreign to us that it's completely familiar to us when we're in our when we're in our soul identity so the blessing that Radha gets is the blessing that everyone gets there's just no, there's no difference there's no well maybe you'll get that and maybe your next door neighbor won't get that and maybe your sister will get that better it's not like this once Mahaprabhu is there Everybody has it. Everybody automatically. It's uh, radically uh, <laughs> democratic. <like that. laughs> so Tanna means literally as much she, so you, you all. You know, if she's, if she's, uh, if she has the desire, then you have the desire. It's 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 not a two two stage process. It's immediate and and spontaneous. Yeah, this is so beautiful and comforting for my Western mind that has this kind of like some level of competition is there, you know, like, oh, I need, if if they get this, that means, and like kind of like a, a scarcity mentality, like there's only mm. so much. And so if they get this, then it's not available for me to get. And this, as you're describing so beautifully, is actually showing us the opposite. You know, it, it is, it's, it's there. It's a limitless ocean. It's like, it's, it's there for everybody and anybody and everybody to, to take advantage of. In fact, it's, it's already yours. You just have to, you know, get out of your way, your own way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, not good mentality for capitalism, like you're saying. The West. <laughs> no competition C here. Certainly not. Yeah, for sure. The free markets are going to have a hard time with this one. <laughs> and to me, this builds, this builds hope. Right? Like this, like, wow, there is, there is hope. If I even have the smallest little door opening you know i don't have to fully open my door and be like yes i want this i'm going to swing in and accept it if i just barely open my door this this compassionate mercy is going to kick the door open and come like a flood of light into um into me and i can trust and i can have faith that i'm going to get flooded and just because i'm seeing someone else or feeling someone else getting flooded that I can also get flooded as well. Well. Radha's moon-like face is the abode of beautiful moon rays and tender elegancy. Her sweet form is very effulgent, like a spotless full moon. 
showing all its 16 phases and giving joy to Cupid with its treasure of nectar. Her very sweet limbs are very enchanting and are fresh at every moment. When Madhava sees her wonderful, beautiful pastimes that are astonishing at every moment, he becomes enchanted. Sri Prabodhananda sings, O moon of Maharaj Rishabhanu's dynasty, O queen of the bowers, I pray to you, alas, alas, when will we be so fortunate to see your face that is more beautiful than millions of moons rise? Thus ends verse 7. Rade, Rade. Rade, good morning. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit sick. I cannot open my video. Um, but I would like to ask something uh, about what you said before about the radical demo democratic mercy. And oh. um, um, so sorry, it, f it feels like a wonderful idea to me, but... I feel like there is a gap. I cannot access this thought that you are sharing, this feeling. It, it feels like there is something missing in myself to connect to that, to be really confident or to experience, to have the, how can I say, the to consider this as a reality uh, that I could experience. Yeah, there's something I really don't get it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, there's nothing, nothing to be sorry for. I'm sorry <laughs> you're feeling that. Um, there's no missing element. Every one of us is perfect and complete. No assembling necessary. We have complete, perfect souls. We have complete, and because we have perfect souls, we have perfect love for the divine. And the difference between that fact or that reality and us living in a complete and perfect relation to God, which is a complete and perfect relation to our soul, is our material coverings. And that means, as you know, we've heard it so many times that we confuse our bodies and more importantly i guess our minds and our material monkey minds 
with our souls. So that when I say it's democratic, that I mean I'm I'm referring to this idea that there's no qualification, that there's everybody has it. But the trick is the one you're pointing to is that not everybody has access to it because we're all in our material natures at different at different levels. So the the less we attach to this material idea of who we are, you know, I go to my office and there's a name on the door and I think, oh yeah, that's who I am. Or there's a name on my post box. Or there's a name on my passport. The more I hold on to that and and live my life in that, the less I will have this access to 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 my spiritual identity, my spiritual life. So I insist everybody has it. And then what you're referring to is accessing it, digging away the dirt to get to get to it. And this is what spiritual practice is as a devotee. I, identifying the little details in our everyday lives where we, we're attaching to our material being. Why do I need to win that argument with my boss? Why do I need to have the furniture arranged uh, that way? Why does, why does, why does, I don't know, why does driving that direction and that instead of the other so important to me? These are all attachments and each one of them is one more layer of dirt on top of our, our tzvarup. So our practice, and like there are a hundred different meditation practices that do this, our practice needs to help us to realize the difference. Realize that we're attaching to our material qualities. And once we realize for each little one, then we're detached. It's like, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I've told this before, maybe you've heard it, if you have, then uh, just close your ears, about uh, cloud, shooting clouds. Did you do this when you are a child? Very simple. You lie on your back in the grass, and you look up at the clouds, and then you find a cloud, and you concentrate on it, and you say, poof. And within a few moments, it disappears. I hope you've done this. If not, then please. When, they, when it gets warm again, do it. And of course, we know in our material consciousness that our brains don't destroy clouds. But if we put ourselves in our spiritual consciousness, then we know that the clouds are always moving and that our perception of them is always moving. And if we watch a cloud for not even that long, a few minutes, it always changes. And we have destroyed it. Not materially, but because our consciousness of the way that clouds move and the, where we are and who we are and what the, the sky is, we've understood that the one I focus on disappears always. So the key is not to be able to destroy it with your brain, but to understand that it's it's moving 
it's disappearing all on its own in relation to us. So it's a way of detaching from our material attachment to the cloud. Same way that we could detach ourselves from our material attachment to our, to our car. Once you, once you realize that you're not identified with your car, then somehow the car disappears from your soul consciousness. And it gets out of your way. And just that little bit of your soul can be liberated from that material blockage. So, do you mean, Udava, to become conscious about my um, addictions or um, clinging to certain reactions, expectation? I feel there's a lot of expectation, actually, um, that hangs around. <laughs> And to get conscious about it, will slowly soften it or even eliminate it. I'm sorry, maybe I did not understand you right. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Um, but conscious in the really deep sense of the word conscious. So, so not just, oh yeah, I know I, I like my car, but rather realization that the car doesn't exist. Um, realization that it's only, and I really, and I really mean, doesn't exist. So it has no reality in the very strong sense of the word reality. When I've understood that this car is absolutely nothing for me, that it has no reality for me, then I'm freed from it. And our addictions, it's a very, that's absolutely the right word. That we're attached to, we're attached to attachment. That's what addiction is. <clears throat> it's not the car itself. It's the, it's the, our drive to be attached to things to hang on to things. And it's this attachment, it doesn't matter what the thing is, it's just the being attached to it that blocks us. I speak from authority, I'm attached to it, a million things, so I, I know my way around. I'm not at all liberated. And then how can we find the spirituality in this material? Is there a way of reversing our attachment somehow to connect it again to the spiritual reality that it has also? I think you don't need to reconnect, but the connection's there. Nothing needs to be reversed once you... Once you... Once you detach. I had an experience uh, uh, this last week. I had an argument with a colleague. I mean, not a shouting argument like this, but a disagreement. And it really... And I really let it... Um, go into me, <laughs> I really attached to it, to the point where I was thinking about it all the time and arguing in my mind against this guy, fantasizing about all the emails I would write, how I would have the better arguments, what kind of authorities I could, you know, call to win the battle over, you know, something stupid. It was probably the title of a book or something that we had to agree on or 
something completely, but I lost complete um, perspective. And then finally, with some help of some friends and some meditation, I, I let it go. I said to myself, and I believed myself, that this has no greater meaning. And you can always put it in the time perspective. Will I remember this in uh, one month? No. Will I remember it in one week? Will I remember it tomorrow? No. And once you let go of something like that, and that's what I did, then there's this, this feeling of bliss that comes. That I don't need to argue with this dude and I don't need to win in order to be myself. And it's just my ego that's playing a game. And the ego loves to do this. The, our egos are notorious. So. And when I really focused on the fact that it wouldn't matter in a week's time, it will all be forgotten, then I really understood that it's not real. This is why Acharya say that the material world is not real. This means it will not exist. It will not continue to exist. It will disappear. And your soul will always be there. Therefore, it is real. I don't know, I don't want to dominate here. I hope that the example helps. Yeah, thank you very much, Rahum. Rahum. I feel that yesterday there was a beautiful answer given that can also pertain to this and this kind of like both removal of our or i would say maybe becoming aware of our attachments as well as um how to how to realize more spiritual in the material world and that is to put <clears throat> to put Radha Mohan in the center. This was beautifully described yesterday. And, and what that means to me is, is to offer everything that we're doing to them. And so when we're, when we're getting in our car to, to drive our car, we're offering that car to Radha Mohan. It's like, oh, this isn't my car. This is Radha Mohan's car. I am giving this to her, to her service. And naturally, we can become more aware because maybe we're like oh i'm giving this to to radharani to radha mohan and then maybe we feel kind of like ooh, no I'm, I'm not giving this to them this is my car and this can maybe help help us become aware move into this state of consciousness as Uddhav is so beautifully describing of like oh that's interesting i i just noticed that i have this attachment to this car and by continue to tell ourselves, well, I'm going to offer this to Radha Mohan for the service of Radharani, then we can become aware of, of these attachments that we have. And, and at the same time, these material things can become spiritual. Um, to me, one of the beauties and some of the great mercy from this tradition that we're in is that in relation to some other spiritual practices and religious practices is that we don't actually have to do anything to have these attachments dissolve we become aware of them and as we become aware of them they they naturally at least my experience has been like some attachments that i have had um and still many 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 countless more i have but some of the ones that I have had that I've noticed dissolve in me, I haven't done anything. Um, I haven't felt like I'm like, yeah, I'm going to like 
you know, break this attachment or dissolve this attachment, I've, I've become aware of it. And then just as Uddhav is describing, like, as I've become aware of it, I find that it's just, it's gone. I don't, I don't, I'm not attached to that part of myself anymore. And, and that to me is, is this mercy that we were, we were describing before that's kind of seeing the, the opening in the doorway. And as the doorway is being opened, we're becoming aware of it, then the mercy is kicking the door open fully and helping dissolve these, these attachments. I don't know, maybe that's not connected or helpful, but that's just my, my feeling. No, that's very helpful, Mahatma. Thank you. And I think this is a little bit in the direction what I was thinking before to reverse this everything usually I unconsciously use for my own pleasure or benefit and to get more conscious in all these actions. How is it? Can it be for the pleasure of somebody else or even Radharani? So, yeah, thank you for bringing that in. Yeah, I mean, several several days ago we had talked, there was a line in the, it was in verse 2, we were sharing that even in the Sadaka Vesh, there is a strong vibration of his identity as Sri Radha's maidservant. And Gurudev was like, double, triple underline this line, you know, like highlight it with all the colors and make it very, very big and obvious. And this is basically this thought of, I am Radha's maidservant. Do I need this or not? Like, is this benefiting my, is this what a mandri would do? And we kind of expanded this into a question we see across a lot of traditions. You know, what would Jesus do? What would love do? What would Radharani do? What would maid servant do? What would, however, whatever word description fits best for you, we can be asking this to ourselves all the time. And it's similar to me like when I offer my actions or anything that you offer to Radha Mohan, if you have some kind of, if you're going to offer something and you're like, oh, I don't want to offer this because I feel like it's not something that they would want. You know, my, I'm going to offer this action. Oh, this isn't a loving action. This isn't something that they would, they would appreciate. Then this can help bring awareness to, to our kind of our attachments or our, um, our actions that are maybe, some coverings that we're interested in dissolving. So it was, I'm really glad you, I remember the morning Mahatma, that from this first two was really strong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it means. So the 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 support was. Uh, I offer my obeisances, obeisances, and in, in every direction I see Radha. Mm. And when we come to the point <clears throat> where we see Radha everywhere, then we're giving up our ego everywhere. We're serving in every direction. And this will take us to to our goal. So yesterday we talked about seeing others as monetary. So seeing all friends and colleagues and and enemies too as monetities. As a way of making service complete, complete universal. Everything is service. So from driving the car, like you said, Mahatma, or cooking the food, 
or doing our jobs. When we conceive of these as service, then, then we detach from them. Then we don't attach to them materially. They're all given away. They're all offered. This also keeps us in this loving mood in Radharani's Bhav. Hmm. I know I think about some of my um, conversations and interactions I've had with people recently and I perhaps was not either speaking not either with this speaking, loving mood, nor was I seeing them. I guess if, if I would have been seeing myself as a mandri and seeing them as a mandri, I probably would have had a, a different conversation or phrased some things differently than I did. And I love that, Udav. I think it's just another tool. It's another way for us to continue to increase and live, become aware of living in and when we're not living in these these loving feelings that we're that we're trying to cultivate that our desire is to cultivate 24 7 Verse 8, question mark? Uh oh, feel good? When can I become the broom for sweeping the courtyard of the cottage? in the playgrove of Maharaj Rishabhanu's daughter, who is an ocean of rasa, and to whose maidservants the supreme male person who wears a crown of peacock feathers always pitifully prays for her audience. When can I become the broom for sweeping the courtyard of the cottage in the playgrove of Maharaj Vrishabhanu's daughter, who is an ocean of rasa and to whose maidservants the supreme male person who wears a crown of peacock feathers always pitifully prays for her audience.
correct me if I'm wrong here, the anyone that has the text in front of them, I'm going to try to just kind of streamline the verse a little bit. It's a little bit confusing to me. Um, perhaps we can read it as, when can I become the broom for sweeping the courtyard of the cottage in the play grove of Maharaj Rishabhanu's daughter, whose maidservants always pitifully pray for her audience. No, it's it's Krishna praying. Okay. That's what I was like a little bit. So he's praying to the maidservants. Okay. Please help me get into Radha and see her. Oh, he's praying to the maidservants. Yeah. Wow. And to the maidservants. Okay, the Supreme Person always pitifully. Okay, very good. Thank you. That makes more sense. Wow. Which, you know, suggests this point that Gurudev has been making lately that. That yet Radharani is superior, but even the maidservants are indispensable. It can't be done without the maidservants, without the Manjaris. Mm. So they're they're the main actors in the in the Lila. I think this is what Gurudev is meaning when he's saying that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is three, not two. Not that other than Mohan, but also Manjari, because it can't be done without them. Mm. They're not just helpers, they're the, what do you call that, gatekeeper, gatekeepers. Maybe I'll read the verse one more time with a little different emphasis to maybe help clear that, at least for me. When can I become the broom for sweeping the courtyard of the cottage in the play grove of Maharaj Rishabhanu's daughter who is an ocean of rasa and to whose maidservants the supreme male person who wears a crown of peacock feathers always pitifully prays for her audience. The greatness of Radha's maidservants in the previous two verses, the sweetness of the Vasanti Rasa, Mohan's vernal Rasa Lila was revealed to Sripad. Mohan had abandoned all the gopis that were his heroines 
in the Rasa dance and went to relish the sweetness of Rasheshwari's Radhika's moon-like face in a lonely bower. In the previous verse, Shripad lost that vision. So he prayed for the vision of Radha's sweet face. Now, Shripad's heart floats once more on the waves of prayer into the kingdom of transcendental pastimes. He gets the visions of these pastimes by Srimati's grace, not through his own endeavors. There's another answer to Vandana. Mm. All right, it's a bit what you said too, Mahatma Ji. There's nothing to do. It's more like not to do. <laughs> yeah, stop doing. If we can stop doing, then. His visions are spontaneous, and in them, it is as if he directly faces Radha and Mohan. Srimati revives the fainted transcendental youthful Cupid of Vrindavan, Mohan, by sprinkling him with the nectar of her own bodily company, playing amorous games in a decorated bower house with him. Nagara Mohan becomes naughty when she becomes naughty and Swamini goes mad of love. She cannot get enough of playing with Mohan. who is the amorous mellow personified. Sham also loses himself when he is served by the unprecedented ingredients of Madana Rasa. the topmost loving ecstasy of Sri Radhika. He is like a beggar sitting in a palace, hoping to get a meal. Beautiful. Yeah, amazing. Well, the food is all over the place. The opulence is all over the place. The beauty is all over the place. He just, if he could just please have some. <laughs> Swamini is his art teacher who teaches 
her submissive hero. Wow. The arts of Shringada Rasa, the amorous mellow. It's amazing here, we, words like submissive and pitifully are used to describe, you know, Krishna, like God in this, in this verse and commentary. Amazing, the power of Radharani. <laughs> in his form as a maidservant, looks through the latticed windows of the kunja and is blessed by seeing these sweet pastimes. How wonderful! <laughs> How wonderful! is the course of love suddenly swamini changes her mind she mercifully remembers her hundreds of girlfriends that were searching for her and mohan in this rasa night and thinks alas how sweetly we are playing here how sad that my girlfriends cannot relish this Alila Shakti, pastime potency, made Srimati change her mind so that the pastimes of the Yugalaki shore could be enriched. How? Radha and Mohan's girlfriends fully extend and increase their loving pastimes. The Sakis sweetly tell Radha about Mohan's love for her and tell Mohan about Radha's great love for him when they are separated from each other and thus they increase their loving attachment for each other. They help them to meet each other they cause the heroine to become angry with the hero to increase the hero's eagerness for her love they make jokes Encourage the Yugalaki shore. Deceive their superiors. And help in increasing their loving Leelas in innumerable ways.
without the help of the Sakis, these pastimes cannot cause wonder. So very nice. So, so rather than Mohan are in <clears throat> the middle of this wonderful uh, Leela, the love making Leela. And the other says, wait, wait, if I include my mandaris, my girlfriends, mandaris and sakis, the pleasure will be even greater. If I let them serve me, if I give them the right to serve me, then the love will be even greater. This is the, the story of Bhakti. So we, if we think of ourselves in the position of Manjali, then we understand that if Radha lets us serve, then her loving relation with Mohan will be even greater. Our service increases the love, and we're allowed to serve by Radha's kindness, by her mercy. So, I had one question about the, our Gayatri Mantras. Just now, Uttabaji also mentioned, I got an answer, uh, same as Jayananda Maharaj. I asked Jayananda Maharaj, we chant first Gurudev, then Mohan and Radha, and why we need to ask Rarita and Saki's mercy? We want to become a manjari. But uh, here it's very clearly the answer come to me. Without Saki's activities, just now Uttavaji says, Anantadas Baba says, without Saki's help, manjari cannot serve. Sakis makes their difficulty also, teasing also, and sometimes glorify also, joking also. Like a team, the Sakis activity give us seva. Gurudev often said we should clearly understand the difference, Saki and Manjaris. That's why sometimes we, I, I'm used to like uh, go to Sanchari's, <laughs> like uh, the devil says, oh, now you are Saki Baba. Then from this discrimination, I understand uh, we can check ourselves. Now we are doing Saki's side or Manjari's side. We should clearly understand what Saki's seva and what Manjari's seva. And more and more, I want to respect and uh, beg much from Sakis, but sak because Sakis are very important, respect to her, but we are Manjaris. This is what I understand now, by your mercy, more. Thank you, mm -hmm. brother. love this point, Uddhav, that you drew attention to about how her desire is to have the Sakis, even when she's relishing with Mohan, she is thinking of the Sakis. 
she has this desire to also have them come close and help to increase their loving pastimes. And this desire for us to come close to them is similar to what we were talking about earlier with the mercy almost being like forced upon us. You know, they have the desire, they're pulling us towards them. And this, to me, also increases our hope. You know, it's, it's not entirely up to me to have the desire to meet them. That's, that desire is also coming from them. They're also desiring for us to join them. They're saying, hey, come, like, come help us. You know, and we're praying, please let me, let me come help you. And this desire for us to come help serve them, I feel really shows her, her great compassion and gives me a lot of hope that it's possible. When Mohan, the jewel of Russex, sees Radhika in this pensive mood, he understands what is on her mind and thinks to himself, Oh, well, when she is so worried about her girlfriends, then there can be no more joy in our love plays together. I'd better go and look for them. She, he, goes out of the kunja in search of the sakis. But just after he left, the sakis come up from the other side and meet with Radhika. Seeing that Sham does not return, Srimati thinks, Tonight, there is Rasa dancing and the forests are filled with thousands of beautiful Vraj gopis. Surely, that king of womanizers must have met some other heroine.
thinking like this, Srimati becomes jealous and angry. Manini. Sri Rupa Goswami says in Ujvala Nilamini that this mana is a result of pure love only. Fear cannot arise without affection and proud, jealous anger, mana, cannot arise without love. Therefore, Mana reveals the love of both hero and heroine. Srimati engages her maidservants <laughs> as gatekeepers and forbids them to allow Sham to enter the Kunja. When Mohan returns to the gate of the Kunja, unable to find the Sakis, the Kinkaris at the gate forbid him entrance, saying, O king of womanizers, where have you gone, leaving our mistress? Swamini is angry. You have no right to enter this grove. Go back to that girl where you have been. Go away from this gate. If you stay here too long, our Swamini will rebuke us. How many pitiful and anxious prayers to come into the Kunja Peacock feather crowned Shama Sundra then offers to Sri Radha's gatekeepers with folded hands. The Kinkaris don't leave their post for even a moment. Here, this sentence just now Mahatma Ji read, the Kinkari don't leave their post for even a moment. Gurudev says, here is underline. Means Kinkaris are always one point to do their seva. This is Tai Baba. Never deviate for Swamini. This is very important for us to cultivate our sadhana. This one pointness is very important. Gurudev said we should run from here. Rade Rade.
Mohan's voice is anointed with humility as he prays with folded hands. Other than you, maid servants, I have no shelter. Make it clear to your Ishvati that she is angry for no reason. I did not do anything wrong. Only to please her, I went out to look for her girlfriends. Where should I go if you girls let me down now? Krishna is the supreme male, God himself. Although all the people of the world pray for his mercy, now he prays to Radha's maidservants with folded hands. Maybe we stop here? Yeah, I was feeling the same. And this is the last sentence of the soldier of So, so many beautiful feelings and parts to meditate on throughout the day. Swamini's compassion for us. Mohan's pitiful prayers for the maidservants. The loyalty of the King Kharis. Mm, the loyalty of the King Kharis, yes, thank you. Happy Akadashi, everybody. <laughs> Happy Akadashi. Jai Jai Shri Radhe. Dandavats to all devotees, Shri Radhe.